This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time once again for Mises Weekends. Very pleased to be joined by a friend of ours, Professor Steve Hankey. A lot of you will know he teaches at Johns Hopkins, frequent writer for Forbes magazine. But for our purposes today, he is involved with actually heads up the Troubled Currencies Project at the Cato Institute, which is very interesting given what's going on in Turkey and Venezuela. So, uh, Professor, great to see you. Thank you. Jeff, great to be with you. Well, I, I'd like to start off with a little bit of background. I know from speaking to you that you knew Hayek, you knew Milton Friedman, you knew Murray Rothbard, you know Ron Paul. Give us a little background on uh, on how you came to be involved in economics and Austrian thought. Well, I, I was involved really from al- almost the time I could walk in, in markets because I grew up, I'm, I'm an Iowa farm boy, and, and as an Iowa farm boy, you, you listen with your grandparents your grandfathers in particular, to, to two radio reports every day. One is the weather report, and, and you listen to the weather report because that influences the quantity of grain that you're going to produce. And, and you also listen to the, the, the price reports and the stock reports, from especially from Chicago and Omaha, because that will determine the prices you're going to receive for the quantities you produce. So supply and demand, you, you, you get onto that pretty quickly. And, and then in addition to that, I, I became actually fairly sophisticated with derivatives at about age 10 because I was helping one of my grandfathers hedge eggs. He, he had, in those days, he, he, he had a big egg operation and, and they would go around and collect the eggs every day on egg routes from farm, farm wives, you know, would be ra- raising the chickens, collecting the eggs, and, and we, we'd go around and collect them, and then we'd bring them in, and c- what they do is candle them. You, you put them uh, under a light, see if the egg is uh, any good or not. You grade the egg, clean the egg, and then you put them in cold storage. Well, the cold storage, they stay there for a while before you ship them back to, to New York from Iowa. And in that time interval, there's price risk. And mm-hmm. so what we would do, depending on where we thought the markets were going, we, we would sell uh, eggs forward with an egg contract that was on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange at the time. This is, this is 65 years ago. So at 65, I was trading derivatives and learned how to hedge with my grandfather. And then, and then by the time I was 14, that was 61 years ago. I, I was had my own trading account, was trading soy, especially soybeans. So all, all of that would be, you know, plus I had a million jobs and everything else. All that would be illegal today, you know, with child labor laws. <laughs> you, you couldn't work and <laughs> you obviously couldn't open an account and be speculating in soybeans. But at any rate, that that's the market thing. So markets were just and natural. I, I, I understood markets. We, we, were, we would take livestock, to, especially to Omaha, and you, you'd watch the auctions, and you, you even knew how the auctions worked and so forth and so on. Then I, I entered university at the University of Colorado in 1960, and the first course I, I took in economics, the formal, first formal course, was taught by Raguel Malak. And it was on European economic history, but he, he was a great devotee of Schumpeter. So he, he would trumpet Schumpeter literally every lecture. And so technically, that's the first time I, I came in contact with an Austrian economist was, it was in El Malak's course. Then by the time I, I entered graduate school, started graduate studies, uh, uh, one of my professors was Fred Glahey who you know, I mean, he's a friend of Mises Institute and has written several books on Hayek and Austrian economics. So Fred was uh, teaching theory at the time as well as econometrics, and I had Fred, and he he was one of my dissertation advisors, actually. So so that was a little, uh, also uh, some Austrian, and, and then the the other one at the University of Colorado is Ken Bolding was one of my professors, and and, and of course Bolding was was very 
he, he wasn't an Austrian, but he was very familiar and introduced mm -hmm. and very friendly to Austrian economics. Then if we jump after I received my PhD in 1969, I was, I was actually doing very applied micro systems analysis, doing things like designing water systems and basically figuring out how big the pipe should be for an optimal system, that sort of thing. It, it is super micro. And, and I had an appointment in the late 1970s uh, at the, Inst the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And that's located at, at a schloss outside of Vienna. And Mrs. Hankey and I actually lived in Baden by Wien for about a year. And and just being in the environment mm -hmm. was the clincher for me. I mean that 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 was that was it. And and at about that same time, of course, Hayek received his Nobel. And I remember we I don't exactly know how this was arranged, but we had the good fortune to have a private dinner at the Maison Blanche restaurant in Washington, which was, was a great restaurant at the time. This, this was about, I think, 1980. And so Hayek got in a very deep conversation about psychology and philosophy with Mrs. Hankey. And finally, he stopped and he, he said, you're French, but you seem to have kind of a German accent. He said, do you? And she said, well, I suppose I do, because half of the family is from Vienna. So he asked the maiden name, and and uh, I asked if Mrs. Hankey knew so-and-so. And she said, yes, that's my great aunt. And Hayek said, the most beautiful and intelligent woman in Vienna. And one of my great flames. And uh, apparently the flame it was extinguished when he came to the United States on a Rockefeller Foundation fellowship. And when he went back, the, the aunt was married to uh, actually a judge in, in Vienna. And that, that was the end of that chapter. But we had a great meal. They, they finally threw us out at midnight from the Maison Blanche. We took Hayek back to the hotel, uh, accompanied him up to his room to make certain everything was okay. He, he had a, a, a little bottle of schnapps next to his bed. He said he, he always had a, a shot of schnapps for medicinal purposes before he went to bed. And he did so, and we said goodbye. And so we, we stayed in very good contact, obviously, ever since then. And then, and then uh, Later than that, the, the last couple of years of his life, the, the great uh, Austrian economist Hobbler lived in Washington, and Mrs. Hankey and I would always go down at least once a week and have tea with him and make certain he was okay. He was in his 90s. Austrians tend to live, as you know, pretty long. So fortunately for, for us, they, they usually go into their 90s. Well, it's all that hiking and mountain air, I think, but... Uh... Well, a schnapps is okay. Too. Yeah, and the schnapps. Now, you know, lately you've been really all over the financial talking head shows talking about hyperinflation. How did you become involved in studying currencies and, and in particular studying hyperinflation? And uh, how had this become a, a niche for you? Well, th this became a, a niche because in 1985, this is an Austrian connection, uh, I've been a professor here at Johns Hopkins uh, for almost 50 years, and, and uh, I'm proud to say I, I was a, a, the fastest one to ever be promoted from PhD to full professor. And under the old regime, the old German regime we had at the time, and that is that uh, the only way you could get tenure at Johns Hopkins was to be a full professor, mm -hmm. or, or, or as they used to say, a full bull. So in any case, 1985, uh, I, I got a I got a call from uh, Dr. Albert Friedberg, who, who you know at the Mises Institute. He's been involved with helping the Mises Institute. And Friedberg said he was he was a a very known commodity and currency trader in Toronto, and and a very Austrian in his orientation. And he'd read a few things that I'd written in Barron's at the time. And he said, could you come and have lunch in Toronto? And I said, fine. I went up and saw him. And by the end of the lunch, I was the chief economist at Friedberg Commodity Management. 
in, in Toronto. And, and we were trading commodities, which was, was fine. The first big trade we had, by the way, w- that I was involved in, I, I did kind of a plain vanilla analysis and modeling of the oil market and concluded that OPEC would collapse and oil would go below $10 a barrel. So we put every kind of short position on we possibly could, including shorting the uh, Saudi Rial and, and the Kuwait dinar. And uh, as you know, OPEC did collapse in 1986. Oil prices actually did go below $10 a barrel. All of our ships came in and, and I thought, gee, this is, this is easy. You know? <laughs> this is great. And our positions actually act ex post facto we, we found out we're just huge. We, we had 70% of all the short interest in the gas oil contract in London. So we were really very big players. And, and that gets into the currency. Mm-hmm. So, so then, then we, had, we had other, other big trades, uh, which I don't have to bore everyone with a trade by trade. But in 1995, I was the president of of one of our units, Toronto Trust Argentina in Buenos Aires, and, and that was the the best performing fund in the world in 1995. We, we were up 79 and a quarter percent on uh, what was in effect a currency trade because we, we had one position. This idea of diversifying portfolios is, of course, completely silly. You, 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 can, you can diversify and you have a lot of holes in your basket, as they say, but if you know what you're doing, you get one big position and, and you stay with it. Our position was Argentine bonds denominated in pesos. 1995, the tequila crisis, everyone said Argentina would collapse and, and, and they had a convertibility system that we thought we understood. The, con- the currency system, and, and so we put everything in, in that basket, and it, it turned out to be a good one. So that's the start. Now, now, fast forward to the, so I've been trading currencies for, well, really since 1985, uh, and, and still I'm trading currencies actively. But the hyperinflation thing comes into the picture because it, it, it is related to currencies because if a currency collapses, inflation soars. And, and there have been 58 hyperinflations in world history, and, and all of those have involved currency meltdowns, become complete destruction of the currency, and then the hyperinflation takes off. And you say, well, how, how does all this happen? I mean, you know, and, and it happens very simply, as, as Friedman taught us, of course, that everywhere and every place inflation is the result of increases in the money supply well that, that that is true but there's more to the story and that is well why does the money supply grow so fast and the money supply grows because in these hyperinflating situations the government spends money and for one reason or another their their financing sources either don't exist or dry up on them and and what are the financing sources? You, you can have taxes, and and tax your tax base can dry up on you. For example, when the when the former Soviet Union collapsed, or what happened in in, in the Soviet system, there weren't taxes. There was no mm-hmm. tax administration at all, and so all these new countries were the government was spending money, but they they didn't have any they didn't have any tax system. So in the, in the case of Venezuela. The, the tax system, and so you had a lot of hyperinflations around the time the, the Soviet Union collapsed because no tax revenues. The bond market, there, there was no bond market in those mm-hmm. countries. They didn't have bonds, and, and, and domestic bonds anyway, and, and international bond market, they were cut off from that. They weren't established, so they had no source of revenue there. So you go to the central bank if you're the fiscal authority and you say we've got some great bonds to sell you and the governor of the bank says yes i i, I agree and he, he basically turns on the printing press literally, literally and you're off to the races and and as you do that as the inflation starts going up the tax base if you have one starts disappearing in real terms on you because inflation is going up and you have something called the tansy effect Vito Tanzi is the economist behind the Tanzi effect. So the Tanzi effect works like this. 
if inflation is going roaring away and going up mm-hmm. and up and into triple digits and, and your tax bill comes in December, but it isn't payable until April, well, by the time the government gets your money, it's not worth very much. So so the tax base shrinks and, and the bond market shrinking and you just keep going back to the central bank for more and more and more and the thing takes off. In the meantime, of course, people it's expectations people are rational and and they expect the currency to collapse because it's losing purchasing power so they get rid of the local currency and in the case of venezuela the bolivar is a hot potato and what do you do you, you either buy commodities but of course venezuela is fundamentally a socialist operation and and there are no commodities to buy because everything's under price controls so you can't buy buy many commodities, not much sugar to find. The shelves are empty. So you go to the black market and, and you get dollars as fast as you possibly can. And the and the currency on the black market or the free it's the free market really collapses, and and you get this this kind of vicious circle cycle going on and 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 you're you're really dead in the water and and it just keeps going and going and and it can go to extremes i i noticed and observed very carefully the hyperinflation in yugoslavia because in 1990 i actually was uh, the chief advisor for for the new markovic governor government that was going to throw out socialism and and reform the economy. It never happened because Milosevic took over. The socialists, the old communists took back over. And what happened? Hyperinflation. And at the end, in January of 1994, the, the hyperinflation had reached 313 million percent in one month. In one month. I mean, this is just unre- unreal. But but if you look at the the, the model of course, the, the money supply was going up, but but the, the real engine of the thing was this huge fiscal deficit in which the central bank was supplying 95% of the finance for government expenditures was coming from the central bank. The taxes base was, was completely gone. There was no bond market. And that, that so that was, that was a story there. And it, it's a story with every one of these hyperinflations. It's it's no they the the hard if there was a hard budget constraint on government expenditures it becomes softer and softer and finally it just completely disappears and there you are you're you're kind of in the soup so that that's the the long and the short of it the 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 real innovation uh, Jeff that that I came across it, it is using purchasing power parity to be able to translate changes in the exchange rate into changes in the inflation rate. And and I you can measure it once you get into hyperinflation, it's just one to one. It's a perfect, mm-hmm. absolutely perfect correlation. Because the economy in a hyperinflating situation like Venezuela, it, it, it is dollarized already. The unit of account is the US dollar. Everything in Venezuela is calculated in the dollar. So you get a little movement in the Bolivar dollar exchange rate that's translated right away into, into overall inflation. And so that's the kind of insight that I had. It's an old theory, purchasing power parity, but the way it's usually used is, is to look at inflation differentials and try to predict what's going to happen to the exchange rate. Now, I, I, I've reversed it. I look at what happens in the exchange rate to see what the inflation rate is. And and in hyperinflation, actually, you can do it, and you can measure things very accurately. Now, I should warn the people listening, you get lots of stupid things done by the IMF. Of course, it, we, we all know that. But one, one thing they're doing, they're, they're, they're claiming that they can forecast where hyperinflation is going to be at the end of the year. Well, you, you can't forecast the course and duration of a hyperinflation. It's totally impossible. So they have no forecasting model. It's a, absolutely a sham, but you see it in the, in the newspapers all the time because this is a big international government-sponsored organization, and, and they have credibility. Right. 
So, so, so the reporters are like stenographers. They, they report whatever the IMF says, they, they report it. And, and you will find that now about Venezuela all the time. And, and actually, I can tell you, today, the inflation rate is 65,320%. Wow. I, I, measure, I measure it every day, and I, and I know exactly what it is. And, and that, by the way, is, is a basket of everything. It's just not consumer goods, but all consumer goods, all services, all assets, anything that moves is included in, in my mm-hmm. aggregate basket. Well, one thing I'd like to mention about Turkey, and we see this all the time, I wouldn't really call Turkey an emerging country with 70 or 80 million people, but nonetheless, you know, we see this time and time again in that the Turkish government borrows in dollars and euro, and it can only produce lira to pay against that borrowing. So so there, there's sort of a whipsaw effect. They're, they owe money in a currency they can't print. Yes, that's the, the that's the nub of the problem, and 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 that's fine if, if your currency was 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 stable. Let, right. Let's say for that that's fine for some place like Bulgaria, where where I put a currency board in in 1997 to to stop, by the way, a hyperinflation. Now that's that's a good example, Jeff, of a hyperinflation. I witnessed because I was President Stoyanov's advisor in 1997, and, and the infl- hyperinflation was running at 242% per month, per month, not per year, per month. And so the question is, what do you do? And I, I said, you make the lev, which was the currency, a clone of the Deutschmark. Now, how do you do that? What's that? How's that trick work? You do a currency board operation. You set up a currency board law, and and that means you can issue lev, but the lev have to be backed a hundred percent with Deutschmark reserves, and the lev has to trade at an absolutely fixed exchange rate with the Deutschmark. So a lot of Austrians get this completely mixed up. They think, oh, fixed exchange rate. That, that's like price controls. It's a disaster, you know, that, that's mm-hmm. a bad thing. No, it isn't at all. The supply curve under that arrangement with the LEV is the LEV is completely elastic in the old days at a fixed exchange rate with the Deutschmark. Since then, of course, it's with the, with the euro. So you have a, a, a completely elastic uh, uh, horizontal supply curve and, and the demand curve moves the demand curve is a demand curve for love so so the quantity of love in circulation is dependent on the demand for love at that fixed price and and it's freely convertible totally free market and what what happened that we put that in in july 1 1997 hyperinflation was crushed within hours and, and of course, when you start out, the interest rate in lev denominated assets is a lot higher than Deutschmark assets. So, so the demand for lev does what? It explodes. Everyone wants lev. So they take their marks in and exchange them for lev to, to arbitrage and, 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 and go from a low interest rate yielding currency into a high one. And, and eventually what happens? Of course, the interest rates in Germany and, and uh, Bulgaria on a risk-adjusted basis come down and, and are about the same. Now, it's back, back to Jeff's question, which is a critical one. Bulgaria can borrow in euros without, without any of this kind of risk. They, they don't, by the way, because they have a very hard budget constraint. They can't go to the central bank and say, turn on the printing press. The only way they could do that is if they took euro <laughs> reserves mm-hmm. in there to exchange for love, you see. So, so there's a totally hard budget constraint. The, the deficit, the fiscal deficit is very small. They, they don't borrow very much. The debt's very small and so forth. But if they did, they, they wouldn't have any problems. They, they wouldn't run this currency risk that you're alluding to, Jeff. They, they, because the, the lev is a clone of the euro. Well, the lira is not a clone of anything. 
It's not attached to anything. And it, and it's completely disintegrated in 1994. It completely disintegrated in 2000. It, it is essentially completely, dis, almost completely disintegrated in 2018. And, and under that situation, if your revenue and funding sources are in lira and, 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 and your liabilities are all in dollars, the, the mountain of debt is is in the and the financing obligations are huge on you. And so this crush will come into play and there will be many firms and organizations in Turkey that go to go to the wall because of the debt and because of the government's mismanage of the currency. So I, I've recommended all, all the time that that they, and most recently, I've recommended mainly for political reasons, they should have a gold-backed currency board system. So should Iran. So should Russia. They should. They should all introduce. They should. They should keep their local currencies for nationalistic reasons. They want to do that. So you'd still have a ruble, a lira, and a real. But all those would be backed 100% with gold. They traded a fixed ex- exchange rate with gold. They'd be freely convertible into gold. And and you'd have a gold block of, of Turkey, Iran, and, and Russia. I, I've just written about this. I think it's the only way for them to go to, to stabilize their currencies. It, all those currencies have been half-baked, never attached to anything historically. It, oddly enough, they the, in Russia, they actually have had a currency board before, and, and, and it was introduced in 1918. And, and who designed it? John Maynard Keynes, actually. And, and so Keynes was, was a treasury official at the time. No, no, no one knew that Kurt Schuller and I dug this thing up. It isn't even in any of Keynes's works, but we we found in the archives he is the guy who did it. And and the white Russians at the time wanted a stable ruble. There were about 2,000 rubles circulating at that time in the Civil War, issued by by various entities, all, all, all private as well as well as the government. They they weren't worth much. They they weren't backed by anything. They they weren't redeemable into anything. So Keynes said, "We'll set up a ruble currency board in North Russia." And and it, the, the the North Russian currency board ruble will be redeemable into pound sterling and back 100 percent with pound sterling reserves. The thing worked beautifully. The the war ended, and, and they still were redeeming in London those those rubles. Er, everyone got paid. It, 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 the, the ruble was as good as sterling. And what I'm suggesting for <laughs> Iran. Turkey and Russia, they should make their currencies as good as gold, and we should have a gold block again. And in short, they should go on the gold standard. Why do you think someone like an Erdogan or a Maduro, is it simply hubris and ego that prevents them from doing this? Is it a lack of historical knowledge? Is it something d- darker? I, I think it's, well, I think it's a lack of historical knowledge for one thing. Uh, there probably is some hubris, and, and I think I, I can't speak about Russia exactly right now, but I know in, in Iran and I know Venezuela very well because I, I was President Caldera's advisor in 1995 and 1996, and the incompetence is just beyond belief. So there's a lot of just pure ignorance. They, they, they don't they don't actually know about how they would do one of these things, and and when. When you look at some place like Bulgaria, I mean, I, I can tell you, I, I fixed the thing in hours. We're talking about hours. We're not. We're not talking about even weeks, because pe- people are rational and people change their expectations almost instantly if you if you come up with a credible system that that they can understand and and you can understand something like a currency board system. But when we look at Turkey, we see a lot of uh, foreign bank debt, just as we did in Greece a few years ago, just as we did in Iceland. Uh, should should those foreign banks be prepared to take a haircut? Isn't that the the uh, proper resolution to their uh, their loaning money to what appears to be a profligate government in Turkey? Oh, that, that's that's what's going to happen. I, I mean, whenever you get into these unsustainable debt burden situations, Jeff. And, and many people don't realize this, uh, or, or, or maybe they realize it, but don't, just don't say it. 
you you've you're bound to be talking about haircuts. I mean, there there are going to be losses involved, and and if there aren't losses involved, you you'll be struggling under a mountain of old debt that that mm-hmm. that, that, that keep you buried forever, and you know, you'll never recover. That that's why, by the way, in Greece, they they really haven't taken sufficient haircuts. Point number one. Point number two, the property rights system and judicial system is a complete disaster in Greece. And and until they they learn the, the magic of private property rights, they, they are never going to recover. Most people don't realize that Greece is a Balkan country. It, it's in Europe, but it, it's it's in the Balkans. And and this is this is Balkan history. So you you really have to know your history. I mean, it, it, any Austrian would know this because, of course, the Balkans were part of the empire for a while, or at least part of them. They were, we're talking about Austria and Turkey. The Balkans were part of either the Austrian empire or, or the Ottoman empire. So, so that, that history is, is relevant. And, and if you read Mises, by the way, he, he has a lot of interesting things to say about the Balkans. Uh, in terms of cultural history and things like that, as well, as well as economics, of course. Well, speaking of debt, let's talk about the dollar a little bit. What uh, I, I know you really look at, at dollar euro, and I know you look really look at dollar gold. What what worries you about the dollar? What keeps you up at night? Well, not the same things. I I don't think that my a lot of my Austrian friends are kind of the, the apocalypse coming down the road or you know the chicken apocalypse yes yeah, uh, chicken little types but if you look at uh, that that I, i'm not that type of austrian uh, it, when it comes to the u.s dollar when it comes to a lot of these half-baked emerging market country currencies yes it, it's uh fairly clear but the u.s dollar i'm not quite there and and, and many austrians for example were fanning this story that we would have hyperinflation in the United States as the Fed exploded its balance sheet after the the Great Recession started in 2009. I I knew this was just utter nonsense, and they they didn't understand what they were talking about, because what happened after the crisis, without going into a lot of detail, you you had the Dodd-Frank and regulation of banks. And you have to look for economic activity is driven by the quantity of broad money in the, in the economy that's circulating. Money dominates, and broad money is what you want to measure. So the best measure is, I, I think, the Divisia M4 measure that, that's put out by the Center for Financial Stability in New York. Professor Barnett is the, the guru on this and, and does all the calculations and so forth. So... So Divisi M4, you want to keep looking at that. And, and, and the big contributors to Divisi M4, the, the elephant in the room, it's commercial banks. Private banks create most of the money in the United States. The Fed is, is peanuts. And, and at the time the crisis started, the Fed was producing about 10% of Divisi M4. So they, they weren't producing very much. And and then you had Dodd Frank and all the the, the Basel uh, three capital requirements being increased, and and that really put a squeeze on private banks and private credit, and the the private credit and private ba- uh, private money contribution actually started declining. It was going down. So if the Fed hadn't have come in. With QE, with quantitative easing, we would have had another Great Depression in the United States. So the step is the first thing that happened that was very pro-cyclical, just what you shouldn't have done. They they laid all kinds of bank regulations and capital requirements on on private banks and commercial banks. So ninety percent of our money supply, the contribution to our money supply, was under massive pressure with all these bank regulations and so forth. So the Fed, in fact, did, did the right thing. They, they, they came in with quantitative easing. And, and if they hadn't come in, we, we would have been absolutely buried in, in a huge Great Depression. Now, the Austri- many Austrians interpreted the 
they, they looked only at the Fed, only at the Fed. The Fed are the bad guys, of course, but the Fed are the bad guys. They are the bad guys, but, but in this case, they looked, they looked at the Fed balance sheet and they said, we are going to have hyperinflation. And, and we, we didn't have, we, we had, we, we had deflation deflationary environment. We're still in a deflationary environment in the United States. Prices aren't going up. We've never had hyperinflation. The reason why bank money, what, what, by the way, in 1930, the, the best book Keynes ever wrote was a treatise, at, at least according to Milton Friedman and, and according to me and, and, and many others. And, and in the treatise, Keynes separated bank money and state money, and state money is produced by central banks, and bank money is produced by commercial banks, and state money is always tiny, and bank money is all, is always huge. Bank m money was ninety percent of the money supply in, in two thousand and nine, and 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 now bank money accounts for 80%, meaning that the state money has grown as a proportion from 10% to about 20% now due to QE. But at any rate, QE basically saved us. It creates all kinds of distortions and all, all kinds of other problems are associated with it. But that's that's more or less the story up to today. Right, but I mean, just, just on, on a tangent here, we look at QE, we look at the Fed's balance sheet, and it goes, you know, it takes almost 100 years to get to $800 billion. Then it goes from $800 billion to $4 trillion in in less than a decade. And, and I think people look at that and say, well, what does that all do? It's just sitting there parked as bank reserves, and now it's slowly being bled off through tapering. But what, what, is it, what does it mean? Where does it go? What, what is it, okay, its effect? Let's get to today then. So I, I had to take the, uh, many of the doomsters and, and uh, my Austrian friends to the woodshed, which I just did. But let's, get, let's now go to, the, to today. You said we started, Jeff by get, well, allowing me to go off on this tangent, which I appreciate that, <laughs> keeping me on a, on a long leash today. Uh, you said, well, what worries you about the dollar today? And, he and here's what worries me. And, and here's the problem you create. It's a cascade of government-created problems. The first thing that kicked it off, of course, was we, we had a great recession. That that was actually caused by the Fed, which we don't have to go back and revisit that. That was caused by a mistake at the Fed. Okay, then we 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 have the great recession start. Then bank regulations. That's something caused by the government. That that causes a problem. It, it, it's very pro-cyclical. And any principles of economics student knows you want to be counter cyclical if you do anything you don't want to be pro cyclical so so then the fed comes in and they try to mitigate the damage that, that the bank regulations are doing and they put on qe and then now today as you said they're 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 unwinding this massive balance sheet and this is a tricky situation and and we're as a result we have very tight monetary policy right now and and we know it's tight because divisi m4 is only growing at about 4.7% per year which is is it isn't super slow it's it's mm -hmm. it's modest though that's nominal growth nominal growth so let's say the economy is growing at 4% if the economy is growing at 4% you subtract the 4 from the 4.7, and you've got inflation of less than 1%. You have very low inflation. So that's one signal. That That's looking at quantities. That That's a Milton Friedman kind of, let's look at our cues, the quantities of money, 4.7% growth. If you look at Bob Mandel and the supply siders, which I, I tend to pay a lot of attention to, you look at prices. And, and you look first at the, the most important price in the world is, is the dollar euro rate. And my comfort zone for that is about 120 to 140. And, and now it's, it's about 116. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it, the dollar is very strong. It's, it's outside the zone, dollar strength. Then you look at the, an, another very important international price is gold. And my comfort zone is about 1200 to $1,400 an ounce. And, it, and it's trading now. It's been a little below twelve hundred. Mm -hmm. It just it's just popped twenty dollars this morning, and it's over twelve hundred dollars an ounce right now. So that that also suggests tightness. 
everything is is very tight. And and then you throw in your thing with the well, what's happening in emerging market countries? You, you've had a lot of these currencies. All the capital is coming out of the mer- emerging market countries now because when the dollar gets very strong, the emerging market currencies tend to get very weak, and capital flows come out of those emerging market countries. So, so we have a very destabilized kind of situation. It looks kind of calm on the on the surface, and we got a big bull market in the U.S. stock market, and and et cetera, but. There, there are things going on. We've had the the Argentine peso lose 38% of its value this year. Turkish lira lost 38% of its value. Um, Iranian real, of course, is a, is a junk piece of currency anyway. Chile is even losing, lost a lot of value. So all these places where you're losing value, you, you've got this exposure that you've alluded to, and that that is a mountain of debt. Debt denominated in dollars, but has to, you have to generate first the the Ch- Chilean pesos, and then exchange those for dollars at a bad exchange rate to to pay off the debt that you accumulated in dollars. So uh, so I'm I'm a little bit nervous about the markets right now. I, I, I I'm. I'm Are you not, nervous about interest rates? Uh, historically, Fed funds rate has been more in the five to ten percent range. You think we'll ever see that? And again, and what would it mean? Well, it, it, it would it would it would mean that, that that the emerging market countries are not the place to be. That's yeah. one thing, because when when we had QE on and interest rates were essentially zero in the United States, everyone was chasing yield and. You see, Roger Garrison's work fits into all of this. What happens when when you have QE? Of course, it mitigates the great, having a Great Depression, but it creates all kinds of distortions. And one is the interest rate is almost zero, so everyone wants to chase yield. You're trying to find yield, and you're you're leveraging. You're doing massive leverage, and the combination of those things, you get a lot of overinvestment. So you look at Garrison's books, and you can figure this out. His his stuff's, I think, the most uh, the clearest thing on these these issues. You, so you start overinvesting. You overinvest in in, in long term capital kind of projects, and you you go into risky in markets. You go into emerging markets. You put a risk on. It's risk on. They call it. And mm-hmm. and now with with the dollar getting stronger. And, and the interest rates going up in the U.S., you, you get everyone unwinding the carry trade, everyone starting to deleverage, and 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 risk off is is what you're seeing. And so risk off, you you get into uh, less risky assets. So so the all these distortions, uh, and this is of course the beauty of Austrian economics. The emphasis is on these distortions. I I. I just wish younger Austrians, as well as older ones, for that matter, would pay actually more attention to actual real markets, because it's it's all in the markets, and if if you're trading the markets, you, you it's it's just so natural Austrian that, it, that it, you don't even think about it. I mean, you you don't you don't go to a, you don't you don't go to a big Austrian textbook or treatise. You you just know it, <laughs> and and if you do go to the treatise, you will find it. Run out of time. Got to ask you a final question that relates to all of this and certainly relates to dollar. Give, give us your thoughts about U.S. debt and entitlements in the future. What, it, what does that mean? C- certainly the dollar is very strong right now, looking strong as, as other currencies uh, wobble. Uh, but should we worry about the debt? Should we worry about deficits? Should we worry about Trump? And most of all, should we, we worry about entitlement promises for the future? Well, I, um, I'm, I don't stay up too late at night worrying about that. I mean, it's, it's coming. If you're trading, that's another thing. I mean, you do have a time horizon and it's, it's not 30 years. Now I realize expectations come into play and can make 30 years come, come back to haunt you today. If you're, if you're trading in a market and something is happening uh, to you with unfunded liabilities coming up. So, so overall that not not too much worried entitlements totally worried all all these things are are bankrupt and will never be paid so so just forget entitlements i mean they they're they're all broke 
and and everyone knows they're insolvent. So they'll they'll play all kinds of games, uh, band aids here, band aids there, and so forth. But the reality is, not, none of it's ever going to be paid. And and the only way to to solve the the biggest entitlement or or one of one of them now there are others that have gotten huge. Social Security, really, you have to have a private social security system. If if you look, for example, it it is mandated, uh, but the social security system in in Chile, of course, is is the is the model. I mean that that is a real private social security system that that has done extremely well, designed by our friend Jose Pinera, and 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 does beautifully. There there's another one that that, that is interesting, and that is uh, after. Singapore became independent in 1965. Lee Kuan Yew, they they put in a, 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 a it is a private in quotes system. Mm-hmm. It's it's a self finance system. You're mandated to put so much money in, but you own the money that's in there and the returns. And and actually, that that fund and the wealth fund that they have in Singapore, it, it's it's one of the biggest sources of revenue for the government. <laughs> It, it finances government expenditures, so you we we have to get away from these pay pay as you go kind of systems that er, everyone knows they're phony and they're 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 bound to break the bank and and this is this is one reason by the way that a lot of the 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 left wing politicians want o- open borders with ma- massive uncontrolled immigration is is to finance these systems. As, as the popula- as the demographics naturally are, are tilting towards a, a older and older, a, a more more aged populations, it puts tremendous strain on these uh, pay-as-you-go systems because they don't have enough young uh, uh, serfs working the system to to pay for them. I mean, it is a form of serfdom actually, but they they want to import serfs. And 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 they don't don't want any control over the borders, and they they just want warm bodies to generate as much as many contributions to these uh, unfunded liability programs that the government has. So so that that gets into a whole other set of uh, discussions that we might have. But uh, you you did mention the word Trump. In, in that laundry list of things, of what are you worried about? And and Trump, yeah. I, I'm very worried about Trump because he, he's got two things that he's doing. He's got he's he's blasting off sanctions as if they're mis, misguided or unguided missiles every day. Now this this is a potential vulnerability spot for the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar, all commodities are priced in dollars internationally, all payment systems are run in dollars or dollar denominated, but what happens if if people lose confidence in using the dollar and the dollar payment systems because their financial sanctions being imposed on it, God only knows who, tomorrow. So sanctions are equivalent to tariffs. They're interferences with voluntary exchange and and Trump is is very keen on both sanctions and tariffs and and, and a whole array of protectionist kind of monitor, uh, uh, trade policies. This this is we we could do another whole show on this, but th- this is very very worrying actually. This is an immediate worry. The unfunded liabilities are an intermediate worry. The the overall aggregate debt is. Is kind of way off in the future, not worrying me very much. I mean, it, I don't like it, but because it, it, it's a form of a lying price. You see, if you don't charge somebody now for 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 what you're giving them, or what they're consuming, or what they're demanding for you, and they're and 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 you're requiring yourself to go into debt to be able to finance whatever you're giving them you're you're giving them a lying price I, that's why i like balanced budgets if the government wants to spend fine for, force them to, to balance a budget and and force them to go to the people and say oh if you want this we're, we're going to increase your taxes to pay for it and and we don't do that now we we just go into debt so it, it, 
all, everything supplied by the government is kind of a lying price. We we think we're getting something at a at a, at a fairly low price, but the government's not telling. Oh, we we we've we've had to have a huge accumulation of debt to finance what we're giving you today. So I I'm very much against lying prices, and I suppose. I can revise uh, somewhat what I just told you, and that is that, yeah, I am worried about the debt, but it, it isn't like it's going to be uh, apocalypse tomorrow kind of thing, which some, some people get so worked up about it, they, they give a, a huge percentage and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and, you know, the whole place is going to explode on me. It, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it, it's... It's a sickness in the system, these lying prices. Governments, if they want to do things, they should charge f- full price, full cost, up front, and s- let, let people decide then. And, and, and my view is people will de- decide to put a thumbs down on a lot of government activity if that was the case. Well, amen to that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know more about Professor Steve Hankey, you can find him on Twitter. He's got 80,000 Twitter followers and a very active Twitter account. He's on a lot of the Talking Head shows. You can follow him at Steve underscore Hankey, H-A-N-K-E. Professor, thanks so much for your time. Great talking to you. Yeah, great to talk to you, Jeff. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.